<laughs> oh, I'm never going to want to eat yogurt again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I mean, you really shouldn't eat yogurt. That's a lot of dairy. Oh, I don't. I eat vegan yogurt, so there's yeah. that. <laughs> How does that okay. taste? Oh, uh, good. Depends on what you get. Depends on the brand. Yeah, it depends on the brand. Depends on the base. Like you know, whether it's almond milk or soy. Like soy yogurt is disgusting, but almond milk and is good. So I'm not a big fan of the soy. Yeah, no, soy's terrible. But I'm very thankful for it because it's all that existed when I first went vegan um, oh. over a decade ago. So, yeah. Hmm. It was I'm old I'm, school I definitely vegan. fall on the almond milk side. Yeah. Yeah, almond milk is great. Except for I love cooking with cashew milk because it's thicker. So in um, soups and stews, it's really good. But yes, other than that. Soups and stews. Soups and stews. <laughs> But other than that, almond milk is my choice, yes. <laughs> that sounds yes. like something a surfer bro would say. <laughs> Soups and stews. Soups and stews. We're going to catch some fat tubes and then come home and get some soups and stews. I got the slow cooker going. Eight hours from now, it's beef stroganoff. <laughs> Welcome to Spoiler Piece Theater, where the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers, we just want to talk about the movies. I'm Megan Kearns. I'm a freelance writer and film critic, editor of Bitch Flicks. My name is Evan Cree, and I'm editor for The Independent. I am co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. My name is Dave Riedel. I write for Salt Lake City Weekly, Orlando Weekly, and I'm a member of BAFCA. You. Oh, yeah, I forgot to say I'm a member of BAFCA as well. <laughs> All right, so this week we have quite a few great movies to discuss. Mm, yeah, we do. And some sequels. Quite a few great movies? Okay, oh. all right, all right, all right. We also have some terrible <laughs> movies. <laughs> I, was... I like how she was like, let me just stop this before it even starts. <laughs> I was I was starting off positive. <laughs> but forget it. It's a ruse. It's a sham. <laughs> all right, we're going to start and end with zombies yeah i love it and i'm Mm -hmm. excited for it okay so the first film we're going to talk about little monsters and no not the 1989 fred savage film no not the one that steve had worked on i know that's amazing no we're going to talk about the new lupita nyong'o film by abe forsyth and with josh gad and andrew england alexander england who is an australian actor and we're going to talk about it and it's amazing. Nice. Okay. So I really liked this. This is about uh, Lupita Nyong'o plays a kindergarten teacher um, with her kindergarten children and they go to a um, petting zoo on a field trip. And um, going tagging along is one of her students' um, uncles who is a fuck up he's a slacker musician Mm. and the film actually opens with him and his girlfriend like screaming and fighting at each other and it's like it shows them in different like the opening credits show them fighting in different places like in restaurants and in the grocery store and at home and you name it they're fighting and the film opens with them breaking up and so he goes to live with his sister and take care of and help take care of his nephew who is adorable probably one of the cutest kids i've ever seen in a film and he has a crush on Lupita Mm -hmm. and so he volunteers to go along on the field trip and the petting zoo happens to be right next to a U.S. Army facility Oh, nice! doing (laughs) experiments called Project Regeneration, which happen to be zombies. And they they get loose and all hell breaks loose. (laughs) (laughs) At the petting zoo. At the petting zoo. And Lupita has to... um, keep the children distracted and entertain them and tell them, oh, it's a game of tag and we have to stay away from the weird people. And when and and one great scene, she has like blood and guts all over and she's like, I got caught in a strawberry jam fight. <laughs> and like, but don't <laughs> taste the jam. Like, yeah, it's just it's 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 really cute. It's really clever. And what it does is it it does such a great job of balancing the adorable children and the kind of cutesiness of it with this really dark, 
um, humor and darkness of zombies actually mm-hmm. like killing people and, and eating animals and there's blood and guts everywhere. And it does this really great job with this tension of those two ends of the spectrum. And Lupita, is, Lupita Nyong'o is such a great actress and she's fantastic in this. And she really has this incredible way of showing that she's scared, but she's incredibly brave and staying strong for the children. Mm -hmm. And Josh Gad, who I can only think of as Olaf the snowman from Frozen. Oh, God. Is this, he's a children's entertainer, on, like on a TV is, show. So he like works at the petting zoo or he just no. happens to be there? He happens to be there because he's an American and they're fil- they, he's, I guess, traveling all over the world, like filming mm-hmm. shows for or episodes for his show. And he's really a creep who's like a sex addict. And- <laughs> Whoa, okay. This <laughs> took know. a dark turn. I know. I mean, yeah. darker Whoa. than zombies. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah. He's actually a really disturbing character. Um, but yeah, and he like constantly is like like he wants to you know not do anything to help the children. And like at one point, he makes a joke about when they run out of food, like, "Well, we can eat one of the kids." And yeah, it's like he's so he's really creepy. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> does he get eaten? He does. Nice. <laughs> Sounds like he deserves it. Yeah, he does by his. Um, so he has a puppet in the show called Frogsy, and the puppet, the puppeteer is the one who's a zombie who eats him. So, nice. Yeah. It's like, oops, um, maybe you shouldn't have been such an asshole, and then you would have survived. But yeah, but it's really fun. It's really great. Um, what I also re- – so every – not every, but most zombie films are an allegory, just as a lot of horror films in general are an allegory. And mm-hmm. this one is – about the fear of having a child and specifically Abe Forsyth, who's the writer director um, was catalyzed to write the script because his own son at the age of like five years old, when he was sending him off to kindergarten had was deathly allergic to lots of different foods as is the nephew in the film here. I see. Yep. And so he realized he had to put all his faith and trust into uh, his son's kindergarten teacher. And he was really amazed at how, teachers really stepped up and he wanted to explore that and added some with zombies. A zombie. Yes. <laughs> and added some zombies. Yeah. Isn't so. isn't that what George Romero says though, that he's like whatever was going on socially in the United States at the time, I would write a movie about that and but I would disguise it with zombies. I mean I wouldn't be surprised if he said that because that is essentially what he did. So yeah, you know, because consumerism and then you got yep. uh I don't even I haven't seen Day of the Dead in long enough to know what that's Oh, I love that one. Know. That's an underrepresented uh, movie in the the George Romero zombie movies. Uh, I I feel like that one's just about madness and like mm. the slow creeping madness that comes from isolation. In the the end military of the world. industrial complex, yeah. also maybe a little bit. Mm. Oh, for sure. Ooh, yeah. Well. I'm glad I'm glad you liked Little Monsters. I kind of wanted did. to see it, but at the same time, I was like, more zombies. I just fucking saw a zombie movie. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm about see, to see a zombie movie. You can never see too many zombie films. So, but I would say this one is, I would say this one's definitely one to watch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they escape yes. then from the, the zoo or how did, what did they well, end up at the end? <laughs> so, that, so actually that gets really dark too because you also see scenes of the military and they want to bomb the whole site because they know that this is an experiment that's gotten out of control so they want to neutralize it but and and they don't know that there are any survivors so Mm -hmm. you're like oh no these little kids and lupita who's amazing anyway so at the end of the film or near the end of the film um they're driving the tractor out um, with so that the kids are singing in the back and Lupita is playing a ukulele and singing and and the guy who's the uncle is driving this tractor. Okay, I was like, who's driving? Yeah, he's driving. Well, oh, and well, at one point the nephew dressed as Darth Vader is driving, and the little boy dressed who has all the allergies 
dressed as Darth Vader is the cutest thing ever. He's he dresses <laughs> Darth Vader a couple times in the film, and it's so adorable. And he thinks he has like powers like Darth Vader when he's wearing the costume. It's so cute. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so they're they're getting out of the petting zoo, and you see this roadblock of the military. So you're like, oh, the military is gonna you know move, and they're gonna be safe, and right? Yay! And they have all their guns pointed on them, and they don't know that there are kids, and they're gonna shoot them when they just think it's adults. But when they realize there are children, they're like the the guy who's in charge says i can't shoot kids again and oh, it's God. like oh fuck Ooh. like jesus it got really dark and a really interesting commentary on military and mm. you know conflict and um civilian casualties which is really disturbing um but yeah so that was so it is really dark but then at the at the very end they are out, but they are quarantined. And so there's this really interesting scene where the children are singing along with um, Lupita Nyong'o and Alexander England, who are they're like leading the children in song and kind of this like fun kind of slumber party kind of theme. Mm-hmm. And the but the the shot widens and you see their quarantined in a military complex so it's just it's like oh yay fun and they're safe but it's also really disturbing actually they're not yeah it's really disturbing so um yeah but it's great well all right then (laughs) you spoiler piece me into one yay yeah me too good it's great definitely see it and it's it'll be and it's the first zombie film we're talking about today. So mm-hmm. okay, nice. Well, what about the lighthouse? Oh yes, so the lighthouse. I absolutely loved uh, Robert Eggers' first film, The Witch. The Witch is mm-hmm. amazing. It's beautiful. It's creepy. It's got so many interesting commentaries on you know sexism and patriarchy, and it's fascinating. The Lighthouse is equally beautiful to watch. The black and white uh, cinematography is gorgeous, absolutely stunning. And the sound design fused with the score is is fascinating. Mm-hmm. That was definitely a strong part of The Witch was yes. like the score mm-hmm. sound design. Actually, was there even a score in The Witch? I can't remember. I, I don't remember. I thought I remember it being something super creepy like there mm-hmm. wasn't or something. So it's in, so it's interesting because you might say the same thing on this one too if you were to listen to it that oh is this sound design is it score is it neither you know what not neither but it, you know what's happening. And in an interview Robert Eggers talked about how um one of, one of the producers on the film said, this is horrible. It sounds like a Yeti moaning. And I'm like, and I'm like that's fantastic. And yeah, so the sound design and the score really work so incredibly well together um, to really evoke this eerie, atmospheric, you know, film, which is just not and it's not scary, but it's an incredibly mm-hmm. unnerving and unsettling film. So. The premise is that there are two lighthouse keepers, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson, and they have to stay at this lighthouse for about a month. And then a boat will come back for them and then they will leave. Mm -hmm. And Willem Dafoe has been at this lighthouse before, but Robert Pattinson has, has never been there before. And as the film unfolds, you start to realize that things are not all that they seem. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't say. (laughs) I do. And their identities are not necessarily what they seem to be because Robert Pattinson in particular has been lying about who he is. And what you see happen, you're unsure if what they're each seeing is really happening. Is it, you know, is it not happening? Is it reality? What is going on? Mm -hmm. And it's really this fascinating film about how solitude and loneliness can erode your sanity and your grasp on reality and what's Mm -hmm. happening around you. And the film also has, so, so they have a really great rapport together, but it also has these, this really interesting queer undertones to it where at Mm -hmm. one point the two embrace and you think they might, make out they might yeah. fuck you they know, might who go knows? go there yeah and then they but they like are repelled by each other like all of a sudden like ew what's happening and like <laughs> yeah and then it's also really interesting because 
the lens at the top of the lighthouse, um, Willem Dafoe won't let Robert Pattinson into that room. He's like, it's only for me. You can't come in. And so it becomes weird. Yeah. So it becomes this like covetous object. Yes. So it becomes this covetous object of like lust and desire where Robert Pattinson like has to get into the room and see what's going on. Let me in there. I got to hump that light. (laughs) 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 Who doesn't want to hump the light? Yeah, I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry. It was a weird thing to say. I think it was a perfect thing to say I, because I because and it ties in even more perfectly. Um, so talking about the lighthouse for a moment, I finished earlier this year the um, Southern Reach trilogy books, which uh, the film Annihilation was based on, mm-hmm. and in love those books and and love the film Annihilation. And in them, the um, the author talks about how the lighthouse is a symbol of comfort and safety for people but all these like horrific things are happening in the lighthouse so it's this it's this really strange juxtaposition and in this film it's kind of the same thing like you're like oh a lighthouse that's you know supposed to be a safe haven a harbor Mm -hmm. you know a beacon and all these weird things are happening so and as robert eggers talks about it he's like oh it's a phallic symbol it's a phallic object so it just Uh. it, it just reifies the homoeroticism happening in the film um, which is really interesting. So the fact that you're talking about humping the light is not really so weird. Okay. All right. I, I guess I feel better now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, the lighthouse is is interesting. <laughs> it sounds like it. And it, it's a period piece, right? This says it's it in the is. 1890s, so it's not like yeah. present day. It's not present day. So Robert Eggers... Um, in an interview talked about how he doesn't want to do present day films. He only wants to do period films because he likes to he likes to be kind of like an archaeologist and he likes to mm-hmm. find very specific period items to recreate the time. Um, and that's exactly what he wanted to do here as well. And you definitely feel that. And a lot of the language feels very not that I'm you know a linguist, but it feels very authentic to the time period as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So it's very, very eerie, very creepy, beautiful to watch, incredible to listen to. All right. Another movie from Robert. I'm just going to make period pieces, Eggers. <laughs> mm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're going to next, Dave and I, we're going to talk about Gary Goleman, The Great Depression. Yes. I'm yeah. excited to hear about this. Yeah. Now, I, did not I have see a question it. for you, Megan. Yes, Dave. Have you seen Gary Goleman either like on TV or have you seen him live or anything like that? I have. Okay, good. So you will appreciate what we are going to say. Yes, I find him really funny, so I, that's why I'm oh, really good. excited. <laughs> yeah. You've if you don't I, like Gary Goldman, I don't think you can be on this show. I think that's <laughs> a rule. Yeah. I'm well, gonna... I'm, phew, I'm glad I passed the test. <laughs> yeah, that's the one test. So That's uh, it. All right. That was easy. That is easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the, the Great Depression, I knew I was going to like it simply because it's called The Great Depression. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Which I mean, is... A very Gary Goldman thing to call it. <laughs> oh, it, it's such a it's such a Gary Goldman title. Um, and I think if you listen to the show, you know we often refer to him or to his bits. Um, and I think if you follow me on social media, it's no secret that I <laughs> Gary Goldman is one my favorite comedian. Um, Sean and I see him multiple times per year, and usually when we go and see him, we get a photo with him. <laughs> <laughs> so um i mean we've seen probably most of these bits in other stand-up that he's done over the course of this year and we even actually saw him do a special show here in somerville where he was rehearsing for this special so we got to see a lot of the stuff but it was really interesting to watch the actual special and to see differences in the material and the way that things worked out and also i just i thought this was a really interesting way of approaching a stand-up special where Normally, there's some type of, you know, personal component in an intro or, you know, some kind of goofy aside, which leads to the special. But I think that this is interesting because it has personal footage and interviews kind of interspersed in it, uh, which kind of does a really good job of addressing the kind of overall point of mental health and depression, um, which is just really incredible. I mean, I remember when we first saw him doing this set or talking about the depression, it was just, it was just an incredible thing to see. It was a very raw, very brave stand-up set to see where someone was talking so 
nakedly about depression and about mental health and a struggle that they had been through. It just, there was just something just so incredible about it. And so I'm really happy that this has gotten a, a large platform for people to see it and people to hear about it and to hear the story. Cause it really is an amazing story of mm. someone combating lifelong depression and how it really got to such a horrible low point, but how it has also come back and has been kind of a, galvanizing thing that has kind of helped him bounce back and to to approach comedy again with this reinvigoration and this um you know just desire to 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 keep working yeah i was gonna say that um not in tone or or not in anything really other than like maybe spirit it reminded me a lot of um some richard like how 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 confessional it is reminds me a lot of richard pryor if that makes sense, um, you know, yeah. because I mean, who else would talk about smoking crack and setting his hair on fire? So um, <laughs> there's no crack smoking or hair fire. In yeah, this. <laughs> but but there is, you know, I wanted to kill myself, you know. Uh, so um, I, I thought that uh, I think the word that Evan used was nakedly. I'll say openly. Um, I thought I, I was kind of amazed that it was so openly um Naked, ha <laughs> ha! I use both. Um, <laughs> it, I just really love it. Really cracked me up. And usually, when comedians try to get a little arty and you know, uh, intersperse either documentary stuff or avant-garde stuff, um, you know, Bill Hicks did a lot of that, and I wished he hadn't. He was one of my favorite comedians. And it's like, just please let's remove some of the weird, you know. 60 frames per second stuff you have here and like just go with the jokes but i i felt like um it was really important to the set to to have a little more context just because if you're just standing up there talking about i was so depressed that i had to move home and i considered killing myself i mean i don't really know if you can um as far as this tv set goes i don't know set meaning you know the, the stand-up set not right. your tv set mm-hmm I don't know if that's going to like work as well as uh, on its own, you know, without the other stuff. So um, I don't know if any of that made sense. Yeah, I I see what you're saying. It definitely has a different kind of um, feeling seeing it on TV versus seeing it in the room. Um, I definitely agree. I think having having the parts where you see the people in his life, where you meet his mother, you meet his wife, you meet uh, his therapist. Yeah, his he often his wife Shade, and, and I love how he always says, "My wife Shade, not the Shade." I was like, <laughs> "My Wait, Shade. what? Is he married <laughs> yeah. to Shade?" Yeah, it's really funny. Um, yeah. I mean, all of it is very funny. I mean, and and, and like, it, there's a lot of really funny conversations that have nothing to do with depression, but like also find it, it's like there there's just like a little bit that's like attached to the overall through line, like when he was talking about you know growing up in school in the seventies and him being jealous of millennials and their to their take on because uh, they're so nice to each other so nice (laughs) and there's this whole idea about people being you know people younger people being well hydrated and that's why they're in better shape than people who grew up in the 70s and 80s who never (laughs) drank water and um it's just all very funny and his comedy is always just so clever and um yeah i would just i'm I'm psyched for him i think this is really awesome and i think this is going to get a lot of play and i dave you were telling me that this was available for free uh on youtube for what a, a right week for mental health week which i thought was really i don't cool. know how long it was free but it was free through the 12th so it started sometime in october and it was mm-hmm. free through the 12th and that's how i saw it because i don't have um an hbo subscription um and i don't even know where i heard about it i just heard about it and i was like oh i should check that out because i love gary gulman and i've seen him live twice um yeah, it 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 really. Uh, it, in addition to just being a really funny piece of work, it seems like uh, he is very interested in promoting the idea that hey, mental health is really important, and mental illness is not unusual or weird. So it's not. Yeah, yeah. So I I really um uh, I won't get into the details, but I'll just say that I appreciated that. Yeah, it's really good, uh, and I just I think it's really important um, that. You know, he like you said, Dave, that he is is normalizing this and, and telling yeah. people like this is normal, this is okay, and it's not hopeless, and you can get help, and you know that help might take different forms, 
and you might go through periods where sometimes it's just not working. Like either the medication's not working, the therapy is not working, but you know, keep at it. Yeah. That's such Absolutely. an important message to hear. And it's one you can never say enough and you can never hear enough. Mm-hmm. If you're a person who's going through depression or if you're, you know, a family member or friend of people who are going through depression. Um, you know, it's it's so great to hear you guys talk about this and it reminds me in a way of Hannah Gadsby's Nanette, you know, and how mm-hmm. how different that was for a comedy special and how you know, again, how using the word raw, how raw and how open and how she just laid it all out as far as, you know, her trauma and, you know, her mental health struggles. So it's it's great that, you know, here's another comedian talking so so openly, so nakedly <laughs> yeah. about mental health and depression. <laughs> nakedly open, openly <Yes>. naked. <laughs> I'm sorry I said that word. That'll be Actually, the I'm name of sorry. my no, first stand up special, word. openly naked. <laughs> is that the name of your stand-up special you yes said? yes <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah. i mean i gotta get around to like actually writing 55 minutes worth of funny jokes but otherwise you know we'll sure. get on that <laughs> yeah well i mean that's the other thing um gary goldman has been doing this thing on his twitter feed where every day he is um putting out a tip for writing comedy so dave go to that twitter feed check oh that okay out. <laughs> and you'll get all you'll get all the information you need to write that stand-up special cool <laughs> all right well you guys have convinced me to watch it i mean i wanted to watch it anyway but now i'm even more excited i'm gonna bump it up in my queue yeah i'm excited to, to hear what you think since you've seen him in other contexts so mm-hmm. like uh, it, it, I, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from people who haven't seen some of these bits before, so they're mm-hmm. coming to them fresh. Uh, is you know, <laughs> someone who's seen them a few times, and I love them. Like, uh, what am I going to say about it? <laughs> you know, it's more interesting to hear from people who are you know kind of digesting some of the stuff for the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Sounds great. All right. Well, I think it's now time to talk about El Camino. Yeah. A Breaking Bad movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What? Dave, did well, you I've, watch I've this? I've never seen. I've never seen Breaking Bad. Oh so. my well, god! Well, forget your it. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> Although I do know what happens to Giancarlo Esposito because I watched the Netflix spoiler thing. So I mean, that's only one of the most amazing scenes. Yeah, one of the most iconic death <laughs> yeah. scenes I've ever seen. I, like I, my, uh, my jaw literally hit the floor. Like I literally gasped, and I remember as he's stumbling out of the room, I'm like. How? How can yeah. he be alive? He's missing half his face. <laughs> yes! <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I think that's kind of what's so amazing about it is he's missing half his face. He straightens his tie and then just yeah. crumbles. But right, he's still perfectly himself. He has to be all neat and proper. <laughs> but um, just his half his face is gone. He's a skeleton. He's Skeletor. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I was highly skeptical of the idea of a Breaking Bad movie. Same. Uh, Same. Especially one going straight to Netflix. I mm-hmm. just thought I had, I just, I really was skeptical of it being good. And I have to say, I really liked it. And I couldn't believe that they made something that I actually enjoyed. Me too. I thought this was fantastic. I was so excited after I, while watching it, after watching it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Boo! Pre- Sorry. <laughs> What was that nonsense? I, I'm sorry. I what? What is this? Is this the fucking love fest spoiler piece this uh, week? This yeah. is bullshit. <laughs> Don't worry, we're getting to the trash later in the, all right, in the episode. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, there'll be plenty of trash. Plenty, to talk. plenty. But I'm yeah. just saying <laughs> that nothing with Aaron Paul can be that good. That's all uh, I'm saying. Bojack Horseman. Bojack Horseman is brilliant. Breaking Bad is one of the most brilliant TV series mm-hmm. of all time. Well, uh, hold on, though. There's a qualifier. Mm-hmm. And it is that Aaron Paul is not the main character in Breaking Bad. So I would argue he is. I would argue Walter White and uh, Jesse Pinkman are both of the main characters in mm-hmm. Breaking Bad. I yeah. also don't like it that people started dressing as him ironically for Halloween. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why don't you dress as him unironically? Come okay. on. <laughs> Fucking live it up. Well, sure. But that's more. Well, that actually, I think, speaks to a larger problem of the mm-hmm. Breaking Bad audience, which there's a the lot people who of don't problem. get it. The people who don't get it. The people who <laughs> idolize Walter White. The people who think he's great. The people who think that Skylar is a horrible monster when mm-hmm. she's amazing. Yeah. Those people. Those the people, people who... who don't understand the show at all. 
the people who I have no that idea he what you're talking about. Was by the good way, at one point, and then became Thank bad. Thank you. Listen, this is an argument I have had with many people, where mm-hmm. I'm like, no, he didn't turn bad. He was a rapist villain from the start. Yeah, Shauna would Wait, love who, to hear that. Who was? <laughs> Walter White, Brian Cranston's character, Walter White, was a rapist villain right from the start. He tries to rape his wife in either the end of season one or beginning of season two. I can't remember exactly when, but it's before he becomes the ultimate drug kingpin. And it's like, and he's even an asshole right in the pilot episode. So, no, he didn't turn bad. He always was bad. He just had an outlet to be more bad mm-hmm. and be more of a villain but anyway i digress this is about el camino el camino and yeah. about jesse and for me i love jesse i love aaron paul as jesse pinkman jesse pinkman and i've said this many times off the mic and i'm gonna say it now on the mic he for me was the heart of the show he was the conscience of the show and so to see a film that follows him i thought was act- if you're going to do a sequel or a coda, as Vince Gilligan called this, I think this was perfect to explore what happens to Jesse. And I also mm-hmm. love how self-contained it is because this could have oh, yeah. this could have been like, oh, we're gonna flash forward like five years. We're gonna you know ex- mm-hmm. we're gonna spread bring out in all these new characters. Yeah, bring in new characters or look at all of the old characters and follow them. No. And it doesn't. It just follows like what twenty four hours. After basically the, yeah. yeah it's a very short period of time and mm-hmm. like yeah you see old familiar favorite characters in flashbacks like mike and mm-hmm. you, you know you and todd s- and, oh, i was shocked <laughs> by how much todd was in this movie i was yeah. not expecting jesse plemons to have such a gigantic role in this and he's just so fucking creepy so creepy he's, he's just great as disgusting a creep. and creepy the sociopath like mm-hmm. oh he made my skin crawl in this yeah um, <laughs> Dave, to give you some context, um, toward the I end, a of, lot of context, toward the <laughs> end of Breaking Bad, um, Jesse Pinkman, Aaron Paul's character, is imprisoned and forced to cook meth for this group run by Jesse Plemons and his uncle. They're a bunch of like skin neo Nazi yeah. skinhead guys, and they keep you know him locked up in this hole in the ground, essentially. And so you're seeing all these flashbacks of him with Jesse Plemons and Jesse Plemons is like taking him out, but like forcing him to do errands, like dispose of his dead cleaning lady and like all these other different crazy Jesus. things um, all under the guise of, oh, I'm letting you out so you can have some fresh air. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to get some ice cream for you. Yeah. <laughs> so don't shoot me. Like, yeah. Like, it's um, yeah, it is very self-contained in a good way. Um, it's tense. It's extremely so tense. tense. There's yep. several scenes that are just fucking nail. I mean, the whole thing is mm-hmm. tense because, like, so you know, at the end of Breaking Bad, you know, Jesse is um, busted out of this spot by by Walt, and Walt has killed all the uh, all the other people there, and so Jesse escapes, and this literally picks up immediately after he's escaped, and so he's on the run, and the cops know he was there, and the cops are looking for him, and it's just him trying to be on the run long enough so that you can collect a sum of money and go to this guy played by Robert Forster who, oh my who God. helps people disappear. So good. Oh. He helps them like get new identities and go live wherever they need to live to lay low. Robert Forster, I loved when he was on Breaking Bad and he's so good in this. It's also incredibly sad that this is his last performance mm-hmm. since he just died on the day this came out. Um, but the scene of Robert Forster and um, Aaron and Paul at the vacuum shop, I, I could have just watched that. Like I, That could have been the movie and I would have just loved that as well. But yeah, but th- mm-hmm. th- th- you're right, though. There are so many tense scenes like when the cops who are not cops yeah, are in the, are <laughs> are in in the house. Jesse Plemons' oh. apartment and Aaron Paul is in there looking for money that's got to be stashed in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And yeah, these guys come in pretending to be cops. Oh, God, that scene's fucking tense. But for me... It didn't get any better than that moment late in the movie where he has the the Western style shootout with that guy. Holy shit. I was just going to say, I love how it... So Breaking Bad always was a Western, but I love that for El Camino, Vince Gilligan really dug into those uh, Western genre roots with the duel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of times... I'm not I love westerns but I really don't like duels. I think they're stupid. They're not really interesting. Right. This was great. Yes. This was executed so well um in a really tense and interesting way. Yeah. For sure. I, I yeah, I was shocked. This movie was really good and really tense and kudos to the to them. Kudos to Vince Gilligan mm-hmm. for making something that was interesting and tense and 
a complete surprise yeah. <laughs> to me. Well, it's interesting because so Vince Gilligan said that he had the idea to follow what happened to Jesse before the series ended. Mm-hmm. And he it was kind of ruminating, but he didn't tell anybody about it. And he didn't really tell anybody about it until closer to the 10th anniversary of Breaking Bad. And he also like and the reason why he wanted to do this story was because he thought about what would happen to Jesse afterwards. He would have either been arrested by the cops or he or if the romantic in him had his way, he would have gotten away and went to Alaska. And I love that that he went the latter way. But there's a, the tension, you know, throughout the film that you don't know what's obviously going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. And I also love the the that the cinematography and the score and the editing are done by people who either worked on Breaking Bad or work on Better Call Saul. Right. So I love that there's that continuity of the production as well. Yeah. I love Vince Gilligan just has this incredible eye uh, and it, in his shot selection, like in, in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, there's all these like really fascinating shots that are just like, I remember it was a Better Call Saul, I think, where you watch a quarter go through a vending machine and you're just watching the quarter travel through the vending mm. machine. It's just he, he puts the camera in all these places that you wouldn't expect it, but just it makes for such an interesting and atmospheric uh, you know, episode or or movie or whatever that he's working on, and I just love that he's taking those risks. Yes, even if they're a little weird, a little artsy, I just don't feel like I see many other people kind of attempting that mm-hmm. in television or in movies. Yeah, I mean that. Well, that was what was so different about Breaking Bad when I first started watching it was it looked like I was watching a film. It didn't. It didn't feel like a TV series. Mm-hmm. It didn't look like a TV series, and that was really really enjoyable the other thing i want to say about el camino kind of shifting slightly is i really i love that we see we see the flashbacks that are traumatizing jesse because he's so broken and scarred as you would be if you had been tortured and you know dealing with stockholm syndrome and you know all of these horrific things and you know his girlfriend killed and all of that um actually both of his girlfriends killed but anyway they yeah. killed Kristen Ritter? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, man. One of the most iconic deaths in the show, actually. Oh, my God. So disturbing. Yeah. So disturbing. But, yeah. and But I love the, that in such a short time, even though there's so much action and suspense happening, Vince Gilligan doesn't forget that Jesse's also traumatized and that, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's just trying to survive and just trying to get through it all just so he can he can make it out as best he can. Yeah. Um, the other thing I also love is I love th- his letter to Brock. And I love that we don't know what happens in mm-hmm. that. Like, we don't know because um, in an interview, Vince Gilligan said that he want he was going to have Aaron Paul do a voiceover of that letter at the end of the film. And I'm like, no. that would have been terrible. No. Yeah. So he scrapped it, and I'm so glad because it the film just works so much better not knowing what's in that letter and keeping some mystery. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that is a really important part of the film, and mm-hmm. what makes it so tense and what makes it so captivating is that it is also this exploration of trauma and mm-hmm. uh, PTSD. And I guess one final thing I just want to say about it. Skinny Pete and Badger are like the best oh, friends ever. They're the yes. best friends. They're so good to him in this, in the beginning, in the way they protect him and try and help him. I know. And I love when Jesse's like, why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? And he's like, what do you mean? You're my hero. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was so great. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, this was, I was so, so, so pleasantly surprised at how good this was and how much I loved this. Yeah, it was great. If you love it so much, why don't you marry it? <laughs> Maybe <Okay>. I will. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. and uh, the thing of it is, the, the last thing I want to say about this is that, you know, obviously this was made for fans of Breaking Bad and, you know, Better Call Saul. But I would still say that even if you had never seen either show, I would still say this is worth watching. I th- I still think it's interesting, even if you don't get every single, you know, reference mm-hmm. or, you know, when Jesse's pulling up to the, the pink building and I'm like, oh, he's going to see Ed because that's the spot that that's where the bus picks you up to take mm-hmm. you to your new life. You know, even if you don't get all of those moments, I still think it's it's a good film and still worth watching. Yeah, I dug it. Me too. All right. I think it's time for Maleficent. For Maleficent. Maleficent. <laughs> Dave, you do that much better than I do. <laughs> Mistress of evil. 
<laughs> All right, Dave. Do you want me to go or do you want to go? I want to hear your thoughts first, Dave. <laughs> I think this movie is a tremendous piece of shit. <laughs> I uh, sadly don't disagree. <laughs> yeah. You can't call terrible. a movie Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, when A, she's not evil, she's not and evil. B, she's barely in it. Yeah. And C, really when she off. is in it, she doesn't talk. So I'm actually weirdly okay with that facet of it because I think Angelina Jolie is such a great actor that it's okay, you know, if we don't hear everything because, you know, she's a lot going on in her very expressive face, but it doesn't work here. And there's so many problems with this film. So many. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well for, you know, the first problem is that it's terrible. Um <laughs> I mean, that's really its big problem, don't you think? I mean, I mean the yes, other thing is, 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 and I can't believe I'm going to say this, I don't think Michelle Pfeiffer can play bad guys. Oh, I disagree. I completely disagree Oh, give me you. a Oh, give me a bad guy as she played Mother. Well. She was amazing in Mother. And I Which love, one is Mother? Uh, the Darren Aronofsky film with Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem. Oh, right. She was right. That was one of my favorite. I blocked out that movie. Okay. Yeah, same. Well, I <laughs> love that film. And we'll, we can talk about that another time. <laughs> you loved it. Love it. It was one of my. Oh, top my 10 God. Films, this is no longer it. an equal partnership. <laughs> oh, my God. You I loved mother. Yes, I loved mother. I loved mother so much. I can't even tell you. We don't have enough time to talk about it, mm-hmm. about all the things I loved. But anyway, back to Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer's performance. I think it's building. Pfeiffer. I said Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> no, I said Pfeiffer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. I just had to be. I had to be that person. You had to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, I did. So anyway, Michelle Pfeiffer's performance in Mother is outstanding, and yeah, but he, it's passable. <laughs> but in this, it's. It's an abomination. It's terrible. she's really, oh, and I don't think it's, it's so her bad. fault. I no, think I don't this think it's is her fault just at all. A shit screenplay, a shit um, direction. A, yeah, I mean, it's really strange when a movie that you know you would think because the first movie was so successful and made so much money mm-hmm. that they would have a decent budget on this one, but they're like really doing shit on the cheap in this movie, like clearly. Yeah. Um, like it looks like it's made on a sound stage instead of being a really big open world. Um, what else? Uh, the effects of all of the, I don't even know what her race is called. The, the people who fly with wings and horns, whatever uh, they're called. Dark Fae. Dark Fae. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Dark Fae, they look shitty. Um, like you can see like where their makeup begins and ends on a bunch of them. Oh, yeah, um, especially like Ed Screen or Screen or whatever his name is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, Elle Fanning is a really... I, I like Elle Fanning, but Aurora is a really boring character. The prince is a non-entity, and he's played by a different guy. He's not he Brendan Thwaites this time around, who is also boring as well shit, so who cares? <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. What else? It has no Charlotte Copley going, Maleficent! <laughs> um, and it really suffers for that. <laughs> it does. Mm-hmm. I kind of, there were a few moments when I'm, and, like, what are you doing with Chiwetel Ejofer and having him, first of all, covering him, his beautiful face under all that makeup, putting in those garish contact lenses, and then killing him instantly. <laughs> He's the Charles Dance of Maleficent, <laughs> Mr. Sedeval. Instantly, but he does die too early. Yes, I agree with you on that. So here's the thing that I wanted to to talk about about this. So I loved the first one. I love how weird it is. I love that it's different. Mm-hmm. I loved it. And it's not a perfect film by any means. It's definitely not. And I even rewatched it. And I didn't enjoy it quite as much as I did the first time. But I still enjoyed it. And I, I loved that it had a rape sexual assault allegory when mm-hmm. Maleficent's wings are taken. I'm like, yes, this is, you know, weird and different to put into a, you know, in a children's into film. Into what is, and yeah, I basically a kid's it. film. Yeah. And I'm like, I love it. This is such a great take on Sleeping Beauty. And it's really, you know, doing some subversive things with the fact that Maleficent is, you know, Aurora's, you know, true love's kiss and waking and awakening her. Loved all of it. And this... This, <laughs> this, all, so all of that amazing subversion and, and, 
you know, interesting things happening, it erases all of that in this. There's, there is mm. no subversion. It opens with a fucking marriage proposal and it ends with a fucking wedding. And it's so fairy tale esque and so annoying. And, you know, they're trying really, really hard to lean into this allegory about racism and you know possibly oh, it's like zootopia but worse <laughs> much worse <laughs> um but yeah like they're really 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 trying with that and it just it it it's no it's just not good mm. it's yeah. not well done um and also can we talk for a moment about how the it's really a lot of sanitized violence. Like there's so yeah. many, so many of the dark Fae being like slaughtered, but instead of them actually dying, they're just like, Ooh, poof. in like these red puffs of powdered smoke. And so yeah. I'm like, watch That's weird. Yeah, it is very weird. I'm like, if you're going to have this much death and dying, don't teach kids about, you know, the sanitized violence. Like there are consequences to violence. And there's something really disturbing to me about not, you know, teaching that or seeing that. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it, this, the whole thing is just, uh, it, it reminds me of, um, it's like you saw, say, Taxi Driver and then The King of Comedy and you thought, oh, I totally get it. Let me make Joker. So it's like you saw Maleficent and you were like, oh, a rape allegory. Let's make it about people who fall in love and have a wedding in the yeah. second movie. Yeah, it's like, what the fuck? I'm going to make something really subtle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> subtle. Nice. <laughs> Oh my god. Have you ever heard anybody pronounce it subtle and not realize they're mispronouncing it? No. Oh, oh, oh that's I, just sad. I yeah. That's sad. I taught. I used to teach. So Oh, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you got college freshmen like in public speaking class and then they'll say it and you'll be like, Oh no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> but you have to tell them quietly because it's one of those, like, you have to write it in, in the notes that you give them back because you can't be like, hey, Melinda, it's pronounced subtle, you know, because it's, it's, it's as embarrassing as a motherfucker. So, yeah. Nobody named Melinda mispronounced it, by the way. I made up that name. I mean, I didn't make up the name well, Melinda. Well, that's nice that you're protecting the anonymity of the person who <laughs> mispronounced subtle. Yes. I don't remember Maleficent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so anyway, cutting back to Maleficent, um, it sucked. <laughs> there's so many stupid choices in this film, and there's so many things just thrown into this film, and it just doesn't work. So yeah, mm, right. it, it's it's unfortunate. And I, I love her so much, and I, I love seeing her in things, and I love watching her, and I think she's incredibly talented. But yeah, here it's just, it's a waste. It's a waste of her talents. And I loved seeing her camp it up in the first one. And it's like, mm -hmm. where is that here? It's not yeah. campy. It's not fun. It's not interesting. It's almost like she's bored, you know? Yes! Um, and maybe she was because she read yeah. the script and she's like, I know I signed up for three of these, but Jesus. <laughs> um, so, and Very what positive. I would say is, yeah, her the in the first movie, Maleficent, lest we forget that's what it's called. Um she is um hmm, she's not she's she's uh, she's not aggressive, that's not the right word, but she's not passive. In this movie no. she's completely passive, you know? Yes. Like nothing that she does in this movie matters the fuck at all until like the last 3 minutes and then it's kind of like, well you had to have her do this because that's where the screenplay was pointing it. So, you know, right. whatever. Well, that's what was so irritating is, right, You, I think you hit the nail right on the head that she has so much assertiveness and agency in the first one, and she's making the decisions as to where her character goes, you know, within the narrative. And here, it's like things are happening to her. She's being rescued. She's being shown the history of her people. She's being told that she's descended from a fucking phoenix. Like, what the hell is happening here? Yeah. Like, oh, what is going on? It's kind of like Highlander 2. It's like, no, 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 no. You're not actually a mythical being who's human who just happens to, like, you know, be immortal. You're from a different fucking planet, asshole. Mm -hmm. It's like that, except with wings times, and horns. This is one of those times I'm actually glad you guys haven't really talked about the plot because I just feel like it would just be so uh, angering <laughs> to listen to. Oh, yeah. It is it is anger-inducing. <laughs> like... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the hell we watched. Like it There's was no just... there's no reason to talk about the plot. It's so fucking dumb. And the other thing is now I don't I'm on record as not thinking that audiences are inherently smart, but this <laughs> but this movie thinks you're an idiot. 
you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. the people who made this are like, these fucking people are stupid. Mm-hmm. They just want to see the chick with the horns, you know? So. Well, I do, Ugh. but. <laughs> right, but. <laughs> but not in this. <laughs> yeah, no. No, this was, this was such a waste. And I like Elle Fanning, too. Like, I think she's fantastic in Neon Demon and, and many other things, but that particularly comes to mind. But, yeah, but oh, this is just such a waste. And, yeah, it's a waste of Chiwetel Ejiofor. It's a waste. It's a waste of everyone in this film. Oh, my God. He's one of my favorite people, uh, favorite actors ever. And he's this so is good. what you're going to do. I know. He's amazing in everything. He made <laughs> fucking Miranda and Miranda bearable, you know? So is that what it's called? Oh. Or Melinda and Melinda? Melinda, Melinda. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that dog shit movie. <laughs> Didn't anyway. see it for very specific reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which we will not uh, dive into now. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. yeah, so don't see this. <laughs> Sadly. So shall, shall we go on? Because I can't. It's just going to. The more I think about it, it actually kind of <laughs> makes me mad. That's what, so. Well, so that's what happened to me. Like, at, at mm-hmm. the, as soon as I finished watching it, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I just watched. But I wasn't mad. I didn't hate it. I was like. I don't know what I just watched. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, this is stupid. And yeah, it just, it just pissed me off Yeah, because it could have been so good because the first one is so good. And what also irritates me is that Linda Wolverton, who wrote um, the animated Beauty and the Beast and she wrote the first Maleficent, she co-wrote it here too. And I'm like, what the hell happened? The script is junk. Maybe Maybe they fired her and replaced her with somebody else. That's mm. entirely possible. That is entirely possible. Yeah, because there are two other uh, dudes who are the co-writers, so it is possible. Dudes, I might add. Yes, I said dudes intentionally. And, uh, <laughs> well, no, no, no. I know you did, and I think that I think it's important. You know, I, I mean, I don't think that women do everything better, but I do think that if you're going to have a movie where a woman is the main character, it might help, maybe, to have a woman's input. Yeah, you think? You know? (laughs) It's a radical concept. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think we need to move on. (laughs) Yes. Zombieland, double tap. Yes. Our last film. Ending with zombies. Yep. (laughs) Zomboo-land. So we know how Dave feels about it. I also did not care for this. No? Not a fan? No. I think I I was not a fan. (laughs) I benefited by going in with the lowest of low expectations. I just thought... Ten years later, we're seeing a sequel to Zombieland, and as I said to Megan before the movie started, ten years ago, I would have been fucking psyched that this movie existed. Now, I I just thought, why? I don't need yeah. it. I don't care. I don't... I, 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 so I just had the lowest, lowest expectations for this movie, and I think that's why I ended up enjoying it, because I thought it was going to be just the worst, and I found it to be not the worst. I found it no, to be entertaining. Worst. Like, there's so many bad comedy sequels. Like, in, in terms of like bad, the Hangover Two, yeah, Anchorman Two. I almost turned that off. Oh. It was so bad. I think I did turn it off. I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> this you rem- you remember when they were like we were gonna make an, a second Anchorman Two with just like all the different jokes we didn't use, and I'm like, there were jokes. <laughs> oh. So yeah, fucking laugh free that movie. This movie, I at least laughed. I mean, I, laughed. I didn't. I laughed. Yeah, I didn't laugh as hard at this as I did at the first one. And and don't get me wrong, like the first one's energy and novelty just it can't be replicated once you've done it. So like the fact that this movie exists is like you know going in that it's not. The first one was just so different from other things that you had seen, really, that you're like, well, okay, well, how are we going to do this again? And I think mm-hmm. they do probably their best pass at what you would do if you were trying to do it again, where you think, okay, well, we got to have some stuff. You know, we get the characters, we got to do some different stuff in here, but we also kind of need to preserve the overall structure and idea of Zombieland because there's like pretty much all the same rules. They don't really introduce that many new rules to Zombieland. There's like yeah, the we... wet nap rule and the teamwork rule, which mm-hmm. I don't remember being in the other one. Aside from that, it's pretty much all the same stuff. Travel like cardio, uh, double tap, double obviously. tap. Yeah. 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 Um, so you just you know going in that there's only so far I feel like they're going to take it. And so I going in with low expectations, I thought this is pretty funny. Like the idea in the beginning that they open with Metallica just like they did in the first one. Uh uh 
I don't know. It just, it, it was hilarious to me. This like slow mo battle scene on the White House lawn, which is overgrown. that was fun. Yeah, I'll give you that. Absolutely. Yeah. As I said, exiting the theater to Dave, hearing Master of Puppets, it was a great usage of that. You yeah, can that never go was... wrong with Master of Puppets. No, you never can. And if if the rest of the film had been as good as that opening, it would have been fantastic. Mm-hmm. It would have been amazing. Yeah, that was great. And I will say, part of that, I think, it, the reason that scene works so well, besides, obviously, the awesomeness of Master of Puppets, mm-hmm. is um, I'm going to... Make sure I have his name correctly. Chung Hoon Chung, who did the cinematography, who also did the cinematography on um, The Handmaiden and does a lot of um, Park Chan Woo's films mm-hmm. and also did um, the first It. Um, yeah, the cinematography was great. And yeah. it, th- I that's probably the best thing I can say about this film is that the cinematography is amazing and the mm-hmm. opening is amazing. My problem with the film is that, yeah, the first one I liked and I thought, you know, this is really interesting. It's clever. It's meta, you know, tongue in cheek commentary on the zombie, mm-hmm. you know, genre. And, you know, 10 years later, there's been an explosion of genre, of zombie films, you know, in TV series, we know, Walking Dead, right. you know, just that's the only one that's coming to mind yeah. for some reason. You know, The Last of Us, as Dave and I have talked about before, mm-hmm. there's been so many zombie things. So they have to have new material to comment on and talk about. Right. And they don't. What they no. do instead is make references and jokes to Terminator 2 which I love one of my favorite films Mm -hmm. and Jurassic Park and Jurassic World and I'm like what like you have so much material that you can comment on and subvert in the zombie genre and you're blowing it by not using Mm -hmm. it I'm like what are you doing there's that one throwaway joke where Jesse Eisenberg's laying in bed and he's reading the Walking Dead comic and he goes just just so unrealistic yeah oh or there's actually another one with that is a great one I did laugh at that there's a great one when Zoe Deutsch is talking about she lived in the mall like Dawn of the Dead and that's also great Um, but yeah it's like why aren't you exploring more of the genre why aren't you subverting more like you did in the first one and for me because of that the film just had like no inertia and it was just very stagnant and because of that because what made the first one so great they're not even for me they weren't Mm -hmm. even replicating here it was just kind of just yeah, well, they I've heard, like we were just saying though, it's just like how far can you take? You know, so like for them in this moving the story forward is like okay, now zombies have been long enough that you know we could say they've quote unquote evolved. So we have different kinds of zombies. We have like the dumb zombie we call the homers, mm-hmm. and we've got the ninjas and the hawkings, and we have this new kind, the T eight hundred, which is this crazy <laughs> zombie that's super hard to kill. For me, like that is like okay, that's a direction we we so we we know we're not going to be as revolutionary, so we got to find some other ways to advance the story. And that part of it's like okay, we've got these evolved zombies, and then part of it is like okay, the relationships are starting to fray after you know a lot of time together. They've been mm-hmm. living together in their home in the White House for, I guess we can presume for years now. It's been a long that. enough time yeah. that they've been yeah. there. Um, and so it's, you know, like Columbus and which and Wichita's relationship, you know, it's kind of like hit a, you know, like a boring patch and, and Wichita's just like not really feeling it anymore and just kind of like I'm bored and whatever. This Is this it? And and same thing with Little Rock. She's like, is this it? Like, I don't have anybody my own age. So, like, I feel like I want to go hang out with other people. And Woody Harrelson is just smothering me uh, <laughs> as a father figure. <laughs> Which, I don't know. I kind of I kind of found that element endearing that he'd become such an obsessive father figure that he was, like, suffocating to her. I loved that. <laughs> uh, what I did not love was the subplot about how he thinks all of a sudden he is Native American yeah. of Blackfoot ancestry what the fuck was that shit i i i could t- you know it's funny i could feel <laughs> you switching off as that moment was happening on screen when he was like yeah i've got blackfoot you know you know he's like i, I got native american blood yeah, coursing no. through my veins and like for me kind of what made that funny is that i knew that he was just talking out his ass and he was bullshitting and the culmination of it was that part toward the end where he's running and he jumps off the building and all the zombies are chasing him. And in the voiceover, Columbus is saying, you know, this was the great zombie run, the first and last great zombie (laughs) run led by a man who may or Or may may not not. have had native American (laughs) blood coursing through his veins. Yeah. That was the one saving grace for me on that. (laughs) But I, you know, having just watched the first zombie land and they're, 
in the when um they're letting off steam and they're in the souvenir store, they're destroying Native American um art and and Abigail Breslin is wearing like a Native American headdress. Jeez, oh, I forgot and, about that. Yeah, scene. Yeah, so it's like seeing like that theme in both of the films, I'm like, this is some fucking racist ass shit. Like this is really problematic. Mm-hmm. So yes, thankfully Jesse Eisenberg in the voiceover does say like, yeah, may or may not. But I was like, wow. Yeah, that for me I was like, okay, I'm checked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. I-, I need to break in here because you guys are correct about everything. <laughs> But I need to add well, some more. You. Okay. <laughs> so I knew that I wasn't going to like this from the beginning when, like, the first thing after, you know, Master Puppets, blah, 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 Jesse Eisenberg starts talking about how they've fallen into a rut. And I'm just like, okay. So this is kind of like the movie is like, okay, so we're in this rut because mm. it's our second movie and we're not really sure what to do. But the first one made a lot of money and people really liked it. So. These actors have good chemistry together, and hey, Abigail Breslin's like a decade older, and she looks totally different, so let's just fucking do this. Um, It just kind of pissed me off that that was its angle. Um, And also, it pissed me off that they made, and I'm not, I I like Emma Stone a lot, I'm not one of these people who thinks she's the fucking best, but I do like her a lot, and I really- Yeah, she's great. It irritated me that they made her character a nudge. You know, it's just like she's just kind of a fucking dick in this movie for no reason. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, maybe 10 years with Jesse Eisenberg would do that to anybody. But at the (laughs) same time, you know, there's really no good reason for it other than to move the plot forward. You know, Um, it's not a character thing. And I also I like Zoe Deutsch. I'm also not one of these people who thinks she's the fucking best. But I think that like anybody with reasonable comic timing could have played that part. You know, because I don't think there's anything to it. Everyone's like, oh, Zoe Deutsch, she's so funny. Yeah, she's funny. But I mean, I I bet you Emma Stone could have done that or Abigail Mm -hmm. Breslin or Rosario Dawson. Anybody could have literally anybody who's acting in roughly the same age group could have played that. I think there's nothing to it. I actually really agree with you. And and I like Zoe Deutsch, too. Um, But what also what also annoys me about that is. As as a vegan, I can tell you, I notice when I see perpetual stereotypes of hippie vegans and ditzy airhead vegans, it's such a lazy stereotype portrayal. Mm-hmm. And again, in a film where I expect sharper, better writing, it's like, really, you're going to go for the for the, you know, the the low hanging fruit here and mm-hmm. just and just dig into that stereotype and not really do anything different with it. So, yeah, I actually agree. Yeah. One. And and also this movie has different writers, you know, it has a lot of the same people, but it has a different screenwriting team. So um, at least I think it does. I thought uh, they had the same. Am I wrong? It's got the people from Deadpool. Oh, I know, that's right. Um, I can't. The first one, I think. Oh, maybe that's why it Ruben sucked. Fleischer directed <laughs> both of them. Yeah, Ruben Fleischer directed both. Um, yeah. He directed one of my favorite music videos of all time, the DJ format masterpiece. We know something you don't know. But other than oh. that, oh, all right, we'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah, I, one of the other parts that I did find uh, pretty funny is when um, they encounter kind of the mirror versions. You've, you've got Tallahassee and Columbus encounter the mirror versions of themselves, played by Luke Wilson and Thomas Middleditch. Um, I found that entertaining, and how they were kind of like, you know, the Columbus and Tallahassee mirror versions, but like also weirder because they were like actually like each other. <laughs> and that idea that, you know, Luke Wilson's character actually respects Thomas Middleditch and considers him like an equal partner in the relationship <laughs> when it's like not, the, not that same way with, with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and uh, Woody Harrelson. Yeah. By the way, jumping in, it is written by the same people who did the first oh, one. Oh, I'm I'm mistaken. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but they did add another writer, Dave Callahan. But yeah, Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick were the um, co-writers on the so, first one. So you know what happened. So that means that Rhett Reese and Paul, because it never happens that they're like, we're going to hire Dave Callahan. And then they are <laughs> like, no, get the original guys. So what happened was Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick wrote a script. They were hired to write a script, whatever. And then they either weren't available or they got fired. And then they brought in Dave Callahan and probably a lot of other people who didn't get credit mm-hmm. to to fix it. You know, so um, 
I don't know. Not that the original guys are going to have, you know, the best ideas moving forward. But at the same time, it's kind of like the Aaron Kruger thing we were talking about on the Patreon segment. So please give us money. Um, <laughs> you know, Aaron Kruger taking over for the Scream series from uh, what's his face? Kevin Williamson. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, exactly. Scream 3 isn't dog shit, but, you know, it's not great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, well, yeah, I re- feel like, yeah. Oh, go, please. No, I was just going to say, what's really interesting is that um, when I was reading about um, the production of Zombieland and Double Tap, um, apparently um, Rhett Reese Reese and Paul Wernick said that they had tons and tons and tons of material, enough for, they wanted to make this a franchise, not just one film, not just two films. It was a failed TV show. Right, they did the TV show. So I think, again, I think that's so interesting. That they say that they have all these ideas and then, right, and then someone else had to come in and, you know, help out or, you know, which not that that's, a, you know, radically different that happens in films, but it just, it makes me question, like, how good really were their ideas? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if somebody's coming in and they had that failed TV show, but anyway, I digress. Yeah. So anyway, I, I just needed to round that out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know and what? also, by the way, Abigail Breslin's character doesn't do anything. No! I mean, she runs away, but it's like... I mean, she was kind of like a badass little kid. Why is she kind of just douchey now? I don't know. Because she's, I don't know. Because she's a millennial? I don't even know. Yeah, she's got to be knows? the rebellious teenager, right? 20-something, I guess. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. it's just a lot of lazy stuff. Even like the big final battle at the end was like, eh, you know, uh, you know, the first one, you're watching it, and you're like, oh, I don't know if they're going to make it out of this. And then the second one, you're like, well, obviously they're going to make it out of this. When's Rosario mm-hmm. Dawson coming back? Because she's fucking not going to just be in three scenes. <laughs> and then she wasn't. Right. So, <clears throat> eh, meh, meh, meh. Yeah, I also, again, not to belabor the point, but if you're going to have your theme, if you're going to have the theme of the first film be, hey, let's find our chosen family. Okay. Nice. that's nice that's a nice warm mm-hmm. feel good theme then okay can we do something a little different in the second film but again it's the same thing it's oh we're looking for a new home oh wait we already have our home because we're all family mm-hmm. and it's yeah. you know i and i think dave you'd brought up an, an interesting point about emma stone you know being you know annoying in this and you know why was she made to be so you know such an asshole in this and I, again i think that could have been that could have been something that would have been interesting to explore. Like, what do you do in the apocalypse? You know, what do you do mm. in a post-apocalyptic world when someone wants to get married and someone doesn't? Because what do you do in, you know, world the world now? But that could be interesting. Like, what's the point of marriage in a dystopian world or a post-apocalyptic world? And mm. that could have been interesting. And it just, yeah, it just was more, just felt like a plot point. Just, you know. Yeah. Just to- I feel like at a lot of these movies, they're more like excuses for like one liners and they just sort of string the story together between them. Like, yeah. oh, is that the Hope Diamond? Oh, I hope it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What a great joke. Thank you for fucking making me wait 10 years for that mm-hmm. nugget. I feel like generally in these, I laugh the hardest at kind of the understated lines. Like there's, this, yeah. you know, the scene where they're prepping to at the, the hippie commune Babylon to fight all those zombies that are coming and they've melted down all the guns into peace medallions. So no one has any guns. And so Woody Harrelson's looking around for other weapons and he picks up this wooden mallet and he's ready to use it. And just kind of under his breath, Je- Jesse Eisenberg says to him, oh, thanks, Thor. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that was kind great. of like a throwaway line, and and for me, that was some of the times I laughed the hardest is when there's kind of just like a quick little line uh, here or there. Like the first one, I always died when Jesse Eisenberg says, uh, "One and done." I always say, "I said that once." <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just like <laughs> my favorite in the first one is when Jesse Eisenberg is showing Abigail Breslin Ghostbusters, and he's like, "Oh my god, I'm so excited! You're gonna find out who they're gonna call." <laughs> 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 it was so cute. Yeah. yeah. So I agree. I also think the funniest moments are the ones that are not the big, you know, going for the big laughs, mm-hmm. the kind of smaller asides. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So that was zombie douche. <laughs> well, not for Evan. Evan, you didn't think it was zombie douche. No, I didn't think it was zombie douche at all. <laughs> zombie but- douche? I don't know. What would what would not quite douche be? Um, z- zombie, zombie, not so bad. Actually, funny enough, in Little Monsters, to bring it full circle, the adorable little boy tells a girl what a douche is. She's like, what's a douchebag? And he's like, oh, it's this little bag that that women use to irrigate their vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> That's like some kindergarten cop shit Yes, there. it very much is. <laughs> it's very 
cute. All right. So mm. let's recap. We talked oh, about. Oh, okay. Oh, wait. Do we have anything more to say no, about no, we, Zombieland? No, we no, got no, to the no, end no. of the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Little Monsters. Yes, go see it. Mm-hmm. The Lighthouse. I would also say go see it. Oh, I didn't say before. There is a horrific abusive scene to a bird it's really disturbing i almost had to get up and walk out in lighthouse in lighthouse yeah it's really disturbing so if you're sensitive to any kind of animal brutality be prepared aside from that it's a good film all right don't Um, see it ema (laughs) yes it's 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 upsetting okay um the great depression gary gullman yes yay C, C, C. el camino a breaking bad movie hell yeah yes definitely see it boo (laughs) Stop Don't be a hater, Dave. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Save your hateration for Maleficent. Oh, <laughs> oh, right. Forgot about it. Maleficent. Don't go see it. No. In fact, try to find all the digital copies and burn them. So <laughs> I concur. And then Zombieland. Eh. Uh, we're on the fence. Yeah. I mean, it's two to one, so really don't see it. But, you know, mm. we take, you know, Evan gets extra weight because, you know, <laughs> he knows genre movies better, I, I think. I don't know. So uh, well, I don't know about genre generally, but zombie movies. Zombie I, I genre. Love quite a bit. Yes. I love zombie movies, too. I, I, I did mean zombie genre movies. My bad. Excuse <laughs> me. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, just going with low expectations, and I think you'll be plenty happy, just like I was. <laughs> it's still, it's still like, if I think about it, it's still like a three out of five. It's like, you know, it's fine. It's good. I got some laughs, and if you like the first one, you'll probably laugh. I mean, it's not like you guys didn't laugh at all. No, no, it. I did laugh, um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd say see it. You guys would say, meh. Yeah, I'd say you can wait until it comes to streaming, but yeah. yeah. That's true. I could say don't necessarily have to see in theater. Yeah, there's worse things you could see. It's fine. <laughs> Quite <laughs> no, an endorsement. Not. I know. Woohoo! That's a ringing endorsement. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of Spoiler Piece. My name is Megan Kearns. I'm a freelance writer and critic. I'm the editor of Bitch Flicks and a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. And you can find me on Opinion S World. And for Spoiler Piece, Evan, why don't you tell us where... You can find us. <laughs> we are available anywhere you can get podcasts, but you can also find us at our website, spoilerpiece.com. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, we are on Facebook. We're Spoiler Peace Theater. We are at Spoiler Peace on Twitter. Uh, you can send us an email, spoilerpeace at gmail.com, or you can give us a call. 862-21-PEACE. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us a voicemail. Uh, and uh, yeah, tell us we're wrong or we're right, or just say hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah hey thanks rory yeah hey we remember to talk about something uh yeah thanks for the email rory G- <laughs> give me a good laugh <laughs> um and yeah and if you like the show please rate and review us on your podcast platform of choice that'll help more people find the show and if you really really like us uh head over to patreon.com slash spoiler piece where you can sign up for our patreon Um, throw us a couple bucks and you will get exclusive audio each week Uh, this week we uh, talked about the scream franchise in honor of scream being available on netflix yeah yeah. Uh, and yeah we do polls that you can vote in there's a tier where you can actually just straight up pick movies for us to watch Uh, and then with force the qualifier to please nothing three hours and longer (laughs) (laughs) i mean we're people we have lives we have lives I have sort children, of. for Christ's sake. Sort Somebody's got to poison their minds. <laughs> <laughs> that is what parenting's all about, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what I've been told. I mean, that's the principle I operate on. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, sign that up. Uh, sign up for Patreon. Check that out. And uh, if you've already signed up, thank you for your support. We we really appreciate it. My name is Megan Kearns. I am a freelance writer and critic. I am the editor of Bitchflix. And I'm a member of the Boston Online Films Film Critics Association, and you can find me on Twitter at Opinioness World. My name is Evan Crean. I'm editor for The Independent. I'm co-chair of BAFCA and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living, and you can follow me on Twitter and on Letterboxd as Real Recon. My name is Dave Riedel. I don't have a squeaky chair. And uh, where can you find me, Evan? <laughs> Salt Lake City Weekly, right? <laughs> Orlando Weekly, and I'm on Letterboxd and Twitter and Instagram, the Gram at uh, Dave Sees Movies. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you next week. I'm sorry Bye. for my squeaky chair. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you.